So before we get into the sermon itself this morning, I just want to stipulate, this is one of those Sundays where clergy are so excited to preach, and it's also one of the most challenging spaces as well. Because we get such great scripture passages and they're meaty, there's so much in them, and unless y'all would like to sit here for three hours, I don't think we can dive into all that is here. I mean, if you want to stay three hours, just raise your hand. Well, all right, a couple people. I, that's what I thought. So what I want to stipulate the sermon with is that we're going to be focusing on just one bit of this. And you'll hear me touch on other pieces, but we won't dive into them. And I encourage you throughout your week to come back to this gospel reading and to sit with it and pray with it, read it, and see how the Spirit might lead you down some of those other paths. But for our time this morning, I invite us to reflect on what it means to be boldly sent in vulnerability. What it means to be boldly sent in vulnerability. Because in, in our gospel reading this morning and in our reading in Exodus, we see four distinct examples of how to live vulnerably in the world. And <clears throat> I think it's important for us to sit with that, particularly in this moment in time. Because we live in a world and a society, particularly here in the United States, that emphasizes not us being vulnerable, but us protecting ourselves in putting up our, our armors, our, our shields, our protectors, either to protect ourselves or to protect others. And vulnerability is not really something that's seen as a strength or something that we're invited to do often. And yet, as followers of Jesus, we'll see that that's exactly what we are called to live as, is boldly vulnerable. So there's four, like I said, there's four distinct ways that we see this played out in our readings today. And so we're going to start with the reading from Exodus, where we see the first two. And I think this first instance will all relate to, and it's the Hebrew people in the passage of Exodus. They've recently come out of Egypt, they've been freed from slavery, and they've been chased by Pharaoh and Pharaoh's army, and they did this, they crossed this miraculous um, opening in this sea, and they were chased through it. And then once leaving Egypt and being chased by an army, they're then asked to march, to walk in the dead heat of the desert, and they have no water. And so it makes sense that the Hebrew people in this moment are grumbling and complaining for they have nothing to drink and they are parched. And this isn't just an uncomfortable space. This is about life and death. Without that water, they die. And I just want to name the power of what the Hebrew people do in this moment. They name their pain. They name their frustration. They name their fear. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's a very vulnerable thing to do. When we're taught to have a stiff upper lip and to take it on the chin, to be able to name when our very reality is, is just holding on by a thread. To be able to name what it is that we cry out for, what we need to be restored, to be given new life. That's a powerful place of vulnerability that our society tries to shut down. And so that's the first evidence of how I believe Jesus invites us to be in relationship with others in the world. And the first way that we can be vulnerable is in naming when we struggle in naming where our fears are, in naming our uncertainties, naming when our life is at risk. That's a powerful piece of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, of letting our full humanity show in that space. The second place where we see vulnerability laid out before us is with Moses in this passage. Now, poor Moses, I, I can connect with him a little bit on this. To be surrounded by a crowd of people 
and they all look to him for guidance, for direction. And poor Moses, he didn't know what he was doing. God kind of like came and said, hey, I'm a bush. You should come follow me and go free my people from Pharaoh, um, and you'll get there. And so here Moses following the Spirit, following God's calling, and they're now in the desert, no water, and he is leading this community of people. And he turns to God and he's crying out to God in vulnerability, um, what do you want me to do? There's nothing here. I cannot provide water. What do we do? Lord, they're about to stone me. Moses was vulnerable in his fear. Just, just think about that for a moment. He was afraid for his own life because he heard the cries of this people. That cry was a challenge for him. That cry came across initially as dangerous. But look what God does. God tells Moses to go ahead of the Hebrew people, and not by himself, but to go with the elders of Israel and to take your staff with you. Which, let's just name what's going on there. That Moses, in his cry of vulnerability to God, that cry is revealing that he feels that all of that weight sits on himself to respond to the cry of the people and their thirst. But God sends Moses ahead with a community of other leaders with him. And with this staff that God had given to him, in which God performed miracles through, God is reminding Moses, you do not walk forward alone. You do not lead alone. You walk with others. You walk with church. You walk with community. And you walk with me. And you walk with my power and my strength. And that's how the impossible becomes possible. And so in a very real way, part of being vulnerable with God, which Moses shows us here, is that it gives God space to work in us and remind us that the fear that we have in our head and that little voice that says we're all alone, God's able to silence it. And the last little piece that I'll point to in this section with Moses' vulnerability, again, God calls him to go ahead of the people. Now think back to that moment when Moses said, Lord, I think they might stone me. They might kill me. And God says, great, go stand in front of them in the most vulnerable spot you can be in. But this is what happens. When you stand in front of a person, it's uncomfortable. It can feel out of sorts, out of place. But when you're in front of someone, you can see their face. You can see their humanity reflected back to you. And in this space, Moses is able to see that that cry for this water isn't a condemnation of him and his life, but it's this longing for life for themselves. Moses is able to see their pain, to see their cry, and to respond to it with love and compassion in faith through the community that God has given Moses to walk with and the strength that God imbues in him. So sometimes the way that we embody our vulnerability is stepping into spaces that are uncomfortable for us, spaces that we might fear, and yet it's in opening ourselves up in those moments that we can see the humanity of the person right in front of us. And it changes us in how we respond to that cry. The third and the fourth instance of vulnerability I want to draw to our attention are in the Gospels, or in the Gospel reading from John, which we all know how long it is, which means there's a lot in there. So let me just give a quick historical background just to ground this a little bit for us. In this passage, we have this interaction between a Samaritan woman and Jesus. And what we need to understand that this relationship between Israel and Samaria is very fraught. They didn't like each other. They bickered a lot. They, like, think of members of your family that don't get along. That's Samaria and that's Israel. And there's 
several theories as to how that history comes about, but the most prevalent one, it connects back to when the Hebrew people first come into the land of Cana, and, um, Canaan, and there are all these other different groups that are living there, and they have their own religious practices that through the eyes of God and the covenant God has made with the people of Israel, it's idolatrous. And so God commands the Hebrew people to stay married within their family, to keep the faith, to nurture that light. And part of that was by compelling some priests in the temple who had intermarried, intermixed into these cultural religious backgrounds to leave those families behind. Some did and some didn't. And those that didn't, we get this development of the land of Samaria, this deep connection with the Jewish faith, but is also different. There's tension here. And so I just share that background, no matter how we would put our thoughts and opinions on that, that in this day and age in which this gospel is written, in this history, the, the orientation of one's relationship with God was extremely important. And that's why this tension. And so when we come to this space where Jesus meets this woman by a well, it's a very miraculous event that it's happening. Jews and Samaritans didn't interact with one another at all. And yet, here we have Jesus speaking to a Samaritan, who is also a stranger, who also happens to be a woman, which we've explored and discussed this before, how in this time period, in a, such a patriarchal society, the place of woman of women were in lesser places and lower down than the voice and the leadership of men. And so for Jesus and this woman to be talking is disconnecting every single thing that would have seemed normal. Jesus has disrupted, this Samaritan woman has disrupted all of these notions of what is dignified to do in society, do in public. And it all happens around a well. Now, wells are good with water, right? They're life-giving. But this particular well is important because it was planted by Jacob. This was a sacred space in which he and God had interaction and deep relationship. It's where this well and its deep history comes from. And throughout the Hebrew scriptures, whenever we see moments and interactions at the well, these are liminal spaces where God comes into relationship with God's people. It is sacred space. So that's all the historical context and the grounding here. I want to look at the Samaritan woman. Because in this space, she has just come in the middle of the day to fetch water. And here is this strange man from the nation of Israel trying to talk to her. Imagine how unsettling that must have been for her. To, to be a woman and have a man who she does not know approach her and start speaking. Someone of a different faith background and cultural background where there is tension and challenge. And yet, in this interaction, she is seen by this person. And by being seen, it opens her up into deep vulnerability with Jesus. And I want to highlight some of this seeing bit, but I'm not going to go too deep into it. But the seeing happens around this moment um, where they're, they're talking about living water and the, the Christ and the Messiah. And then we have this reference to her five previous husbands. Now let's talk about that for a second. Many interpretations of this passage would say, all right, great, she had all these five husbands and, oh, the, the scandal, you know, Scarlet A almost. But again, think about the day and time that this was written and the value of a woman's word then and how we look at that now and how we see systemically women are not heard, they're not believed. And yet our very faith, Jesus himself, teaches us that we should hear and listen to the witness and to what people offer to us. We should take people at their word. 
And if we take the Samaritan woman at her word when she says, I have no husband, this conversation all of a sudden shifts from being about her sexual morality to a much larger theological conversation about God's relationship with Israel and God's relationship with the world. So back in that history with Samaria, when the Hebrew people were coming into the land of Canaan, you had these different groups and traditions. There are five distinct ones. And so you can read and understand this text that these five husbands that is referred to, this isn't a conversation about the woman, but about Samaria and about the different relationships that the people of Samaria had with these different cultural religious groups. It can open it up in a way. We won't go any further than that, but um, go read about it and sit with that for a moment. Because the result of what that is is that Jesus is revealing that this living water that they're conversing about isn't just for the nation of Israel. It's for all who seek it and all who cry out for it. And here is this Samaritan woman who is seen, perhaps maybe for the first time in her life, seen not as less than, not as an object of marginalization, but as one who stands before God's presence and receives life-giving spirit, life-giving water. Her vulnerability comes out in owning who she is in spite of what the world says that that says about her. She owns her dignity. And with Jesus responding by seeing it and nurturing it and claiming it with her, it empowers her to receive that water. And what does she do? She goes. She goes back to her home city, her hometown, and she shares it. She shares with anyone she can meet this life-giving life experience she had with Jesus. That's vulnerability, too. Because it's not easy to share our faith, is it? It's not easy to talk about the inner transformations that we have, and yet, through her sharing, through her vulnerability, she brought so many more to this source of new life. The fourth piece of vulnerability we see is with Jesus himself. We don't need to do any more historical context. We know how radical Jesus is in talking to this woman and in interacting with her. But in the Gospel of John, there's something that he says that's so important. In response to her claim that the Messiah, the Christ, will come, he says, I am. I am, echoing the words of God speaking through the burning bush in Exodus. I am the very first time in this gospel that Jesus is 100% vulnerable enough to name who he is. This is the first time that Jesus acknowledges that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. And he doesn't reveal it to his disciples. He doesn't reveal it to his brothers and sisters and his mom. He doesn't reveal it to the Pharisees who are colleagues or, you know, someone else in the Jewish community. He reveals this to a marginalized woman from a community that is seen of lesser value. He goes to the margins of the margins, the person that he never should have been talking with in the first place, and shares 100% whom he is. Now that's vulnerability. And I cannot help but think that we as followers of Jesus, those who long and cry out for this living water, that, that in Jesus' moment in this space, he teaches us how we're meant to live our new life once we've received it which is going into those uncertain places, those uncomfortable places, entering out and stepping out in faith to share vulnerably who we are, no matter what we think the world might respond back with. Because, you see, if we truly 
if we truly desire our world to be changed, if we want our world to be more loving and more forgiving and more graceful and more compassionate and more oriented towards justice, and if we truly believe that that new life comes through Jesus, then we need to share that good news. We have to be vulnerable and invite others to experience what we know. Because if we keep the joy of that to ourselves, relationships won't change. It's only by revealing it and sharing it that things begin to move and water begins to be shared with those who are thirsty and the world transformed. So we've explored four different ways of vulnerability. And we interact in these ways in a variety of ways, and perhaps we lean into one more than the other. But wherever you are on your journey with God, I invite you to, to reflect this week on how God is inviting you to be sent boldly in vulnerability, to share who you are, to share who God is, to be honest and open about your pain, your fears, and your hopes, and your joys, and the new life that we receive through the great I am. Amen.